Okay, well, it is 17 past, so given that we've got that hard deadline to meet at the other end, we might get underway if that's okay. So a real delight to have Jennifer Bowen with us. Uh, the title is Mixed Harvests, the Short Life of ABC Radio's Town and Country Hour. Uh, and understand Jennifer is probably very well known to most of you, if not all of you, but as Dr. Jennifer Bowen is a lecturer in audio production and journalist at Monash University. She was previously an editor with the BBC's World Service and has produced many programs for ABC Radio. So well positioned for this uh, very interesting topic and I'll hand over to you, Jennifer, thank you. Thanks so much, Ashley. And thank you so much, everybody who's come, that's great. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, the country on which I'm based at the moment, that is the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. The land has not been ceded. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My talk is about an ABC radio program, the Town and Country Hour, a short-lived program a mere drop in the ABC's output, but I found it worth taking a deep dive into, and I'll just share my screen for the moment now. Uh, the Town and Country Hour began in 1941, following months of planning, from the music to open it with, to the speakers who followed. Now, I've already given away what happened. It lost its title within three years, and the year after that, its rationale, when the Country Hour began in December 1945. So my interest is in how the Town and Country Hour was a predecessor to the Country Hour and in how it wasn't. The decisions that led to the Country Hour took place within a context in which other options were known from which preferences were selected. My paper will show that an examination of the Town and Country Hour is a way of prizing apart some of the pressures on public broadcasting in its early period tensions within the ABC between different philosophies of broadcasting held by its senior managers, as well as pressures from outside, the government's willingness to direct the ABC in the face of perceived political imperatives. This is also about the program's legacy, how an arrangement for rural listeners forged in wartime and finished in post-war reconstruction became the basis for the ABC's continued elevation of rural Australia as a distinct service to the nation. A performance that was, and arguably still is, played out for its intended listening audience in full view of the population as a whole. Town and Country Hour, I would contend, is a productive prism through which to see the construction of radio listener subjectivity in mid 20th century Australia. The binary it set out to bridge perhaps naively, was subsequently reinforced with the consequence of affirming the traditional family as the fundamental unit of Australian society. It entrenched the normative understanding of a rural sector informed by colonial values and the notion of city in which uniformity prevailed. In this paper, I've looked to archives. These are limited, but there are relevant internal ABC documents and there's useful material in press and publications of the time. And here I just pause and give enormous gratitude to Bob Maynard. He funded much of the digitization of the ABC Weekly at the National Library. Bob was a career broadcaster for the ABC in Adelaide, and he was at the last AMT conference. He passed away in the last year, but the gift he left to others is of huge benefit to media history studies in Australia. It's greatly appreciated, particularly in this last year. Rural life and attitudes have been addressed by several historians in Australia whose work I have drawn upon. Don Aitken on country-mindedness, Kate Murphy on gender and rural life, Stuart McIntyre on World War II reconstruction. I've benefited from many analyses of radio's cultural role, its production and reproduction of ways of thinking the world. Ideas developed by Michelle Helms, Susan Douglas and Kate Lacey. Justine Lloyd's recent book on gender and the media directed my attention to intimate geographies. Geography is a recurring theme in any consideration of rural media, but not just geography as location, also geography in terms of public and private, inclusivity and exclusion. And I was interested by Kyle Barnett's reference this morning to heartland media. 
In this talk, I'm going to look closely at the development of broadcasting explicitly for rural listeners between the wards and during a time which uh, several characteristics and affiliations emerge. Secondly, I'll look at the launch of the Town and Country R and its development, and thirdly, its successes. I'll finish by discussing briefly the implications of this narrative. Rural interests were amongst the first to be raised when the prospect of radio broadcasting entered public discussion in Australia. The 1923 annual conference of the Graziers Association in New South Wales passed a resolution that and I quote, up-to-date methods of broadcasting wireless news should be provided. As licensed broadcasting began, farmers were interpolated as radio listeners. The opening in 1924 of 3AR, the first Melbourne station, was preceded by a tour of country towns by the associated radio company, spelling out the commercial benefits of the rural technology. Rural access to wireless was thought to dispel fears of loneliness, maybe a fear for intending migrants. It also cultivated a notion of progressive thinking in rural matters. The New Settlers League promoted radio in its publications in the 1920s. Then, in the 1930s, radio clubs were encouraged in regional areas. Broadcasts aimed specifically at rural listeners were the initiative largely of state departments of agriculture. These were intended to promote better farming practices, a response to perceived poor farmer education, particularly aggravated by the soldier settlement schemes after the First World War. Throughout the 1920s, radio talks in all states were established, in some cases influenced by broadcasting to the rural sector in America. But while American farm broadcasting was led actively by a central federal department of agriculture, Australian rural broadcasting was fragmented. The states had responsibility for land use and farmer education. Farm talks, that were usually weekly broadcasts, were varied in content and presumably quality, as well as organisation. When the ABC was created in 1932, its talks for farmers continued without any central direction. In contrast to the BBC, who had a producer from the British Ministry of Agriculture from 1931. In 1933, commercial radio 2UE in Sydney was the first in Australia to create a daily session for those on the land. This was closely connected to the Farmer and Settler Association, publishers of the newspaper, The Farmer and Settler, and one of the groups who founded the New South Wales Country Party in 1922. Instead of weekly talks by different speakers and often at different times of the day, 2UE hosted a daily session for the man on the land. When 2UE was later sold to 2UW, the session continued. It now had a regular host, Joe Crawcore, a former feed supplier who was well known at local shows in the agricultural circuit. The farmer and settler newspaper didn't miss a beat in promoting the session now on a new frequency. And so too, it was supported by the rural and regional press for various good reasons. It's call for listeners' letters. We serve you, it proclaimed. It's encouragement for young farmers. It's place as a family listening experience. The session set out to attract an audience of different ages and its competitions for junior farmers were particularly well publicized in regional papers. Its presenter, Crawcore, equated the junior farmer of today with the backbone of Australia tomorrow. Above all, it was acknowledged for its positioning of agriculture as work of national importance, one in which women were largely invisible. Among commercial stations, 2UW was unusual in this support for rural matters. It's highly likely that there were political allegiances behind the scenes that enabled it to take place. There was no doubt about the political nature of the session. The Farmer and Settler newspaper was open about its support for the program. However, a rural session on this scale was confined to New South Wales. Commercial radio stations in other states continued to a degree, and over the 1930s, it was a diminishing degree, to host talks from state agriculture officers. So too, the ABC broadcast state agricultural talks, sometimes called for the country man, or the standard title for the man on the land. And from the mid 1930s, the ABC 
occasionally scheduled talks on agricultural policy for national relay and intended for mainstream audiences. So there was no obvious progression from these to the launch in 1941 of the Town and Country Hour. It was on the air on the national network Monday to Friday from 12.35 to 1.35 for to 1 with up to the minute news commentaries specially designed to meet the needs of midday listeners in city and country. Internal correspondence makes clear that it had a specific belief to act as a bridge between audiences in both city and country. It broadcast a mix of talks and news interspersed with music. So why did it come about? Media history often looks to who was instrumental. The ABC's general manager, Charles Moses, had left for military service six months earlier, in more than six months actually, and he'd left in June 1940. The acting general manager was Thomas Berrup. And the, in, the decision to introduce the Town and Country Hour is consistent with Berrup's personal approach to public broadcasting. He had seen the first iteration of the children's program, the Argonauts Club, in 1933 designed so that children from outside the urban area would be able to participate on an equal footing with city children. There were no in-person clubs. There was participation by sending in material, no addresses given on air. In 1941, the magazine, the ABC Weekly, celebrated the second anniversary of the Argonauts revival, highlighting how different its children's sessions were from those of the past. The magazine in 1941 also ran an editorial urging the need for Australian sounding voices on the radio. And it was during Barrett's watch that women were appointed to read the news for the first time. Some of these developments were due to the times, but so many at once suggest the hand of an individual who seized an opportunity to make some changes, to cultivate to a degree more inclusivity with program design. The initial publicity for the town and country hour spelled out its contents. A talk of the day would cycle through a series of themes across the week. Listeners would hear that selection of topics. In the months and weeks prior to its opening, ABC managers in Sydney and Melbourne exchanged names for suitable speakers and confirmed Percy Granger's country gardens as the opening theme music. Monday's talk dealt with farming from weevils in wheat to the storage of fruit, nutrition and wool production. The ABC communicated regularly with the CSIR, the uh, precursor to the CSIRO. At one point, there was a push to get talks on flax on the air quickly. A memo refers to propaganda to get it planted in time. But at other times, the relationship with the CSIR faltered due to the ABC's insistence that the Monday talk be of interest to a non-farming listenership. Tuesday's talk had a broad remit. Women were often heard here less for much of the rest of the week. One exception is a talk by the psychologist and writer Naomi Lewis in the Monday slot, speaking on collectivization and Soviet farms. The federal talks controller Molesworth was happy to book women for the Tuesday talk on gardening, interior design, dogs and diet. Though he was insistent that the session was not merely a women's session. I take that to refer to the intended audience, including men and women. Wednesday's session, it's not clear how letters from servicemen overseas featured there, how they were obtained, how they were selected. There is evidence, however, that contributors were paid. Thursday looked to industry. The initial talks were given by senior industrial figures. Later in the year, the Victorian state manager suggested that it might be better to send their own reporters to factories and industrial plants and tantalizingly, it's unclear whether this was taken up. Friday's talk was billed simply as a guest speaker. These were rarely listed in advance. And so it appears that was the plan to have someone topical arranged at short notice. Guests who have been listed included the Australian writer, Will Lawson, an interview with the Secretary General of the Australian Red Cross, and a Mrs. Jamison Williams speaking on life in Egypt in wartime. The aim of most broadcasting is to have an audience who, by virtue of their listening in, create a shared space. Town and Country Hour set out both to acknowledge and blur the distinction between groups holding specific interest. 
it continued the gendered convention of who spoke on what subject, but it set out to create an audience who met together with their differences. There's no evidence confirming its success or otherwise with listeners. It was duly listed Monday to Friday for the three years it was transmitted. A visual reminder to listeners of the ABC Weekly that town and country were not necessarily poles apart. And then it finished. In February 1943, ABC manager General, uh, Charles Moses was recalled from active service following a directive from Prime Minister Curtin. The government was concerned about rural productivity, given the obligation from 1942 to provide food for the US services in the Pacific. Curtin forbade any further enlistment of rural men, a group who were historically eager to join overseas military ventures. The government looked to broadcasting to keep men on the land. That meant looking to the ABC. A one-off drama in January 1944 extolled the farm front as heroic work, but that wasn't enough. Curtin specifically asked for a daily serial. The ABC approached the writer, the writer Gwen Meredith, sending her a script of a Canadian rural serial. Meredith was presented with an Australian family already conceived. The son at war, the flighty daughter, another son back on the land, as well as the requirement that she maintain close contact with the Department of Agriculture. The serial called The Lawsons was launched in February 1944. It was scheduled in the middle of what was now the new lunchtime session, the farm and home hour. It might be thought that the title picked up from the American radio program of the same name, a daily program that was a prominent part of US rural broadcasting. But there were minimal similarities at this stage between US and, Aust and Australian <clears throat> excuse me, rural broadcasting. The Australian farm and home hour continued many of the elements of the earlier town and country session the news commentaries, and a mix of talks. The difference though is the absence of a regular report from the industrial front. In dropping any connotation of the urban, the new name of the session was an effective frame for the serial within it. The Lawsons embodied a world of farm and family. As a serial, it was a format more closely associated with women listeners. And arguably that was exactly part of the strategy. One way of keeping men on the land was to stop women wanting to leave. This had been reported in earlier inquiries into rural depopulation going back to the First World War. It was confirmed in the World War II Rural Reconstruction Commission inquiries. The Lawson affirmed the affinity of rural and family life, harking back to the ideas of rurality from earlier in the 20th century. It confirmed the relations within the family the man as head of the household, the children, and the women, variously wife, mother, daughter, and in the case of the Lawsons, the cook. This wasn't the first time the subjectivity of radio listeners was constructed as part of a family that made up the nation. The family was the model with royal broadcasts, presenting the empire as a family, the monarch as its head. Now, at this time, the ABC was familiar with another form of rural broadcasting that ran successfully in Canada, its Radio Farm Forum. It was a network of discussion groups whereby rural listeners were enabled and perhaps empowered to raise questions and propose solutions to matters that concern them. There's no time to discuss this here, other than to say it wasn't taken up. The farm and home hour saw the end of the war, but the coming of peace marked its demise. In December 1945, it became the Country Hour, which continues to the present. It included a daily talk on agricultural matters, a regular presenter with good agricultural credentials, and within a few years, junior farmer competitions. It was more than a bit like the 2UW Man on the Land session, but on this occasion, it came from the National Public Broadcaster. I'll just conclude now with a few final observations. Country Hour is often presented as the start of the ABC's rural broadcasting, as if it had no history, but it did have. It followed the creation of a lunchtime session intended to bridge urban and rural. The changes that followed took 
selectively from Canadian models. And I would argue were informed by the developments on commercial radio in New South Wales, where there was no hiding an affiliation with the rural political interests. Mm. While the primary intention behind rural broadcasting was to influence rural audiences, radio's lack of boundaries meant it could impact the larger urban population. The consequence of the country hours assured place in the broadcasting schedules was to impress on Australia as a whole the cultural significance of the country. This contributed to an understanding of Australian identity after the war as built on the rural, its heritage masculine, white and property owning, its destiny to develop land to the full. Economic prosperity was the prize for this, but there was a price. The deal marginalised, or indeed excluded, others in rural Australia. It pushed to the side notions of rural citizenship in a shared public sphere. And it laid the foundations for the conception of a post-war urbanist Australia, characterised by homogeneity. The town and country hour had a short and arguably slightly muddled life, but its successor was more sure-footed in defining and keeping its territory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That's uh, such an amazing history. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, to any questions, we've got about five minutes or so, so um, we'll throw that over to questions. If you want to just open your microphone or put it into the chat. Thank you, Jennifer, that was great. I, I just love the idea that because it's broadcast, I mean, we've been talking a lot at this conference about sort of localism and hyperlocalism, but you're talking here specifically about connecting the town and the country, the bush and the city, through this notion of broadcast, which of course collapses distances. But yeah. like you say, there's a sort of a homogenizing effect as well. Maybe you could expand on, on that aspect a little bit more, please. Look, it's it's difficult to know exactly what people people at the time thought they were doing. I mean, that's one of the one of the issues I'm trying to get my head around. What what were the conceptions of the time that you could achieve by programming a radio uh, session in a particular way? And I think certainly there was an awareness that it did designate an audience and an audience identified in a particular way. So I think there were, I think there was a sense that this was a way of bringing to people together. Arguably, it was very much influenced by wartime, uh, but also looking at some of the individuals who were around at the time, um, the controller of talks at the ABC had always had a rather perplexed view as to why there was even a women's session and seemed to, ex the idea that you could have something that was gender neutral in some way was, was more the kind of thinking he promoted. Uh, the, the radio listening groups that were part of ABC's output at that time very much were presented as appealing to both men and women. So there was a collapsing of, of boundaries there. Um, of course, lots of people would listen to lots of other programs, you know, but whether, wherever it was that they were coming from. But in some ways, this was some, the, the Town and Country Hour was a way of affirming the fact that Australians came from different places and to find some, I suppose, mutual interest in what the other was doing. Bridget. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Now, before I forget, I just need to convey a message from Justine Lloyd. She was in this session looking forward to your paper and then realised she was meant to be chairing Josie Vines. So she wanted to be here, but she literally had to be somewhere else. OK, I've done that. Um, Jennifer, I'm just remembering back to Sybil's conference a couple of years ago, and um, I'd recently read your PhD thesis on um, spoken word broadcasting at the ABC and seeing that you had um, addressed rural broadcasting um, quite substantially in your thesis. And I seem to recall that um, we were saying at AMT, wouldn't it be good to have a dedicated event on the history of rural and regional media in Australia? Um, and I remember telling you about Michael Thurlow's thesis as, as it still was then. So it's been great to see um, Mark actually do the work for us and put this event on. Um, just in relation to your um, paper, it, just a really small point. I wondered about the um, junior farmers competitions. They seem to extend um, for some decades. And I, I wonder if you've looked at them at 
all within the sort of context of the ABC's history? No, look, I haven't really looked at the at what happens to the Country Hour after after the end of the 40s. And what I, I guess what I'm interested in particularly is how it positioned Australia as it went into the immediate post-war period and up until the election of the Menzies government and then beyond. And broadcasting, as we know, was used extensively in uh, that political positioning of attitudes to Australia and the world to, to work, uh, to masculinity and so on. So I, I, I see it within that. I know other things happen. I know that Lorna Byrne was broadcasting in the country hour, I think later on in the 50s. I don't think she was in the 40s. Uh, and, th you know, and clearly there have been other differences. I'm also very much informed by the talk that was given by Lisa Waller two years ago at the AMT conference, where she talked about the extent, the, the uh, analytical work that had been done, looking at the coverage of indigenous affairs in the country hour over the last, I think, period that it would extend back through over the last five years. Um, a, a extraordinary documentation. And that made me think again about the omissions that, that took place um, earlier on. Thank you. Any other questions? We're just about out of time, but if, if there's no other questions, Jennifer, thank you very much. A really delightful presentation, a very insightful presentation, and we appreciate all of the, the work that's gone into that amazing body of work. So thank you for sharing it with us. And thanks to everybody for being here, and we'll have to log out and log back into our uh, main conference close. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer and Ashley, professionals thank you. both. Thank <laughs> you.